on the Diana Felzone show, I have, I'm actually a fangirl and I can admit that, I have um, a man who has pretty much redesigned the landscape of comic books and bringing comic books into movies and he also is penning one of my favorites of childhood, the Archie comics. Uh, I have Michael Uslan next to me, and thank you for joining us today, Michael. It is my pleasure, Diana. <laughs> Great to be here. You have a ton of projects right now in the works, and one of them that you're most excited about that people can actually start pre-ordering on Amazon now is your biography, The Boy Who Loved Batman by Michael E. Uslan. It's a memoir. Can I you see that, I am guys? so proud of this book. Um, what do you do? when you grow up a blue collar kid from New Jersey, didn't come from money, couldn't buy my way into Hollywood, had this dream about doing dark and serious Batman movies, had a passion for comic books like no one had ever seen before, <laughs> but I didn't know anybody in Hollywood and I didn't have any relatives in Hollywood, so the question was how do you get there from here? Right, and how do you get there from Even now I think it's a very kind of nepotistic, world that we live in, no matter what business, but especially Hollywood. And YouTube, sure, it helps to break in, but back back in your day and age, how did you go about this? Well, it's a harsh world out there, you're right. And the key is really about intestinal fortitude. It's about knocking on doors that will guaranteed slam in your face mm -hmm. over and over again. And if you're passionate enough about something, are you willing to go through hell, literally march through hell to get to the other side um, and keep picking yourself up, dusting yourself off, knocking on those doors again and again? You know, when people talk about timing in life and luck in life, the magic is that there is no magic mm -hmm. because the only timing and luck is the timing and luck that you make by knocking on those doors incessantly. So this book, The Boy Who Loved Batman, is really the story of the... Over 10 years it took me from the time I acquired the rights to Batman until our first movie came out because my partner Ben Melniger and I were turned down by every studio in Hollywood. I was told I was crazy, that it was the worst idea they ever heard. Doesn't it always seem that people say it's the worst idea and they're usually the best? It had happened to George Lucas from what I understand. Yeah. So yeah, it does happen. But you know, Diana, it's a test. How much do you believe in yourself? Mm -hmm. How much do you believe in your work and what you're doing? when everybody's telling you you're bad and your ideas are bad and everything stinks. So how did you decide that it was going to be the Batman movies that you were so passionate, or, or that the Batman comic that you were going to turn into a movie? Why out of all of them, because there are so many great ones, did Batman really get you? What, are you Batman? Is that how you related to it? Uh, I think I'm Bruce Wayne. <laughs> uh, certainly not Batman, but I certainly am the boy who loved Batman. Mm -hmm. Because at age eight, when I really truly discovered Batman comics, and I kind of moved from the world of Richie Rich and Casper to the world of Archie, to Superman, and then graduated on to a little bit darker, a, a little bit more adult Batman. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, back then it was the normal comic book reading progression. Mm -hmm. And you did this before you got to Marvel Comics. Um, I like this. This could be like a whole <laughs> summer course for reading, because so many kids don't like reading. This is a great way. You could actually create your own like course seminar going on for colleges. We could do a whole separate hour just on comic books and education. <laughs> uh, and I have a huge background in that and a real belief in that. But at age eight, Batman was my favorite superhero, unquestionably more than Spider-Man or the Hulk or Superman. Mm -hmm. And it was really two reasons. Number one, he had the greatest supervillains, so far better than everybody else. Number two is he was human. He had no superpowers. Mm -hmm. Batman's greatest superpower is his humanity. And at age eight, in my heart of hearts, I believe that if I studied real hard and worked out real hard, and if my dad bought me a cool car, I could beat <laughs> this guy. And my first dream was that someday I would write Batman comics. Wow. And that was what set me on my path. That is so exciting. And, and speaking of setting on, on your path, for people out there who want to buy rights, how do you even go about that? Because when I heard that you bought the rights, you know, I, I'm not necessarily in the movie biz. I don't understand how that works. So how, do, how did you get those rights? Well, it was a different world back then. Mm -hmm. Nobody was buying rights to comic book characters to make into movies. The only exception really was Superman. And the people that were controlling the rights to all of these characters really um, were looking down at comic books. Mm -hmm. They really weren't thrilled that they owned comic book companies. And nobody else wanted it. And when I went to the president of DC Comics at that time, 
who was the gentleman who had mentored me into the comic book business when I started writing and working at DC. He was, he was like a second father to me in a lot of ways, and he put his arm around me. He said, Michael, he goes, since Batman went off the air on television, it's as dead as a dodo. <laughs> he said, please, save your money. Forget about this. And I go, no, I can't forget about this. It's a chance to do something nobody's ever done before. Right. A dark, serious superhero. A dark, serious comic book movie. Nobody's ever done it before. He goes, is there any way I can talk you out of this? I said, no. And he said, all right, come on in. And that began what would turn out to be a six-month negotiation. Wow. Um, and then on October 3rd, 1979, Ben Melliger and I acquired the rights to Batman. I then quit my job and figured, Hollywood, here I come. They're all going to line up on my door. They've got to see the potential for sequels and animation and toys and games. And then, Diana, all the doors slammed, and I was rejected by every single studio in Hollywood. Who was the one that finally said, I get it. I get what you're doing, Michael. Well, in order to get to that point, you have to appreciate a couple of the things that I ran into. I ran into studio executives who said, you can't make a movie out of some old television series. That's never been done before. Mm -hmm. I was told that you can't do a serious Batman, that audiences will only remember the pow zap wham pot bellied funny guy. Right. And then my favorite rejection came from Columbia Pictures um, down the road a piece when I pitched my heart out for the dark and serious Batman. And the guy there shook his head, gave me a tisk tisk, and said, Michael, Michael, you're crazy. Batman will never succeed as a movie because our movie, Annie, didn't do well. How does that even relate at all? I mean, I'm sorry, but Batman is the Dark Knight. And then you have Annie, who's this freckled, red-headed orphan who's singing her heart out. I didn't think that Batman was a singer, but... You, you the look that. on your face was exactly the same look that was on my face at that moment. I said, are you talking about the little red-headed girl who sings tomorrow? <laughs> right, right. He says, yeah. I go, what does that have to do with Batman? Right. And he goes, Michael. They're both out of the funny pages, and that was my rejection. Hmm. So finally, uh, my partner Ben said that he knew a guy. Everybody uh, knows a guy. <laughs> who was younger than the execs we'd been pitching to, a little bit more hip, and um, he and his partner, Neil Bogart, had just started Casablanca Records, mm -hmm. and they were about to get funding to make movies, and Casablanca was going to open up a Filmworks. So he called Peter Guber at Casablanca, and got me on the phone with Peter, and I pitched it on the phone. And he said, this sounds really intriguing. Can you be in L.A. tomorrow? I said, well, I'm in New York. It'll take me two days. Right. So two days later, I was in his office in New York, pitched the whole thing, and the rest was history. Wow. See, if you have a dream, it can work out. You just have to be willing to have that, that go-to attitude and really devote. I mean, you devoted your life to this. It's true. It uh, really is true. And that's what the book is about. The book, um, well, it tells my story and hopefully will make a lot of people laugh along the way. Mm -hmm. um, it's also pretty much a motivational book, trying to let people know that you can take whatever it is your dreams are made of. Mm -hmm. You can take your passions, and if you're willing to do this, not have a sense of entitlement. Get up off your chair. Get up off your butt and make things happen for yourself, mm -hmm. and not wait for the world to come to you. When you look at young Hollywood now, I mean, it's definitely changed from what it was. It, it seems like people are... I don't want to say that they kind of take it for granted that they have the fame and the money and all the perks that go along with it, but you obviously came through the ranks working very, very hard as an executive producer, a creator, a writer, and having a, a movie, The Dark Knight, that has grossed $1 billion so far worldwide, obviously you're not changed. You're still the kid from New Jersey. You still live in New Jersey. I relate to you. I'm from New Jersey. And I know your, your, your son, and he's grounded. How did you maintain that in a world that is so glitz and glamour? I, I think that is really a function of how you're raised. Mm -hmm. um, my wife Nancy and I, for example, made a decision very early on that we were not moving to L.A. We were not going to be part of the Hollywood scene and we, because primarily we didn't want to raise our kids there. Right. We just, you know, life's tough enough. And we felt if we could raise our kids around our families, uh, back east, and um, if they could grow up knowing their grandparents and having that influence in their lives, that that would be a higher priority in our lives. And it's a decision now that I have two young adult children whom I not only love but actually like. Um, <laughs> They're very likable. Well, I, I, I'm very proud of them, and they seem to know who they are, where they come from, and where they're headed. Um, 
I think Nancy and I can both look in the mirror and say, okay, we, we did good. It was a good choice. And you also have a, a love story that we won't go into because it's obviously private, but you've made a marriage work and not only sustain, but also is extremely loving amidst all of this craziness. And I think that is just really to be, no, it's really to be applauded because I come from a family where my parents are going to be celebrating 40 years of marriage in June. And I look at you and Nancy and I think, that's what I want one day. Well, Nancy and I met the first day of our freshman year of college. She actually was not even unpacked when we went out <laughs> for the first time. And as her dad and mom were pulling out of the drive at Indiana University, I was literally walking up. Her, her dad used to say, if I had just thrown the car into reverse instead of drive, everything would have changed. <laughs> everything would have changed, right? But see, you know what you want, and you go after it, and I think you're, you're a devoted person. So when you saw Nancy, you, you said, that's it. Oh, you yeah. went for oh, it. Hollywood style, I took out an option uh -huh. and uh, with this, a whole set of renewals, and it, it really worked out nicely. You guys need to be more like you, I think. <laughs> I think that's. What, I think you could write a whole book on maybe having a, how to meet a girl, make a marriage work. I think that could be in your future. Book two of the trilogy. It's, yeah, you could be the relationship <laughs> expert. Who knew? I do have a couple questions um, sure. from someone who's asking, who is your favorite Batman and why? Can you pick favorites? Oh, it's Gary asking, actually. Sorry about that. Good question. Yeah. Um, I contend that it's the wrong question. Uh, <laughs> if you really stop and think about it, the actors who played Batman wear a cape and cowl, they have a low, whispery, gravelly voice. I can do that voice. And um, it's not so much the differentiation between each Batman on screen mm -hmm. as it is the great difference between each Bruce Wayne. Each Bruce Wayne by each actor has been so completely different. Mm -hmm. Michael Keaton, Bruce Wayne, obsessed, driven to the point of being psychotic. Yeah. Well, this was the first time we ever, anyone ever attempted a serious, dark superhero comic book movie. And Tim Burton, genius that he was and is, said, audiences have to b believe in this guy. They have to believe in Bruce Wayne. They have to believe he's a guy who is capable of putting on a bat suit and going out and fighting crime without getting giggles right. unintentionally. And Michael was masterful at that. He really did win over the audiences and make them believe in that Bruce Wayne. Uh, with Val Kilmer, he was more of a dark, mysterious, darkly romantic um, version of yeah, Bruce Wayne, so they say. Um, <laughs> I can contend. <laughs> to me, he reminded me of back in the year zero, I went to see Frank Langella on Broadway playing Dracula. And it was that dark, scary romanticism that he brought to the stage that I thought Val Kilmer brought to his Bruce Wayne. Mm -hmm. George Clooney was the warm and fuzzy guy next door. And then Christian Bale, I think, has nailed it. Mm -hmm. He's just nailed it for every generation. It really doesn't matter what generation of Batman comics you were raised on, or if you saw these cartoons or those cartoons or these movies or those movies. Uh, for me, for everybody, he is the believable Bruce Wayne on a very personal human journey mm. that we are all taking with him through at least three movies. He keeps his voice pretty much the same while he's Batman and while he's Bruce Wayne, I realize, though. He still keeps that, like, low, gravelly kind of... He has a mysterious quality to him as he plays Bruce Wayne. He has a very mysterious quality yeah. to him. And, um, so the, you never know, sorry, when he's going to unleash. Which is great. Yeah. And you're following his Bruce Wayne story. You, you really sympathize with what this kid has been through traumatically. Uh, it's a gut-wrenching, powerful story of watching your parents murdered in front of your eyes when you're a kid. And you take that, I call it his lost horizon journey mm -hmm. with him, as he learns how to channel the anger and the difference between justice and revenge. It's, it's a fabulous story. For all of you, pre-order... The Boy Who Loved Batman, Michael E. Uslin. You can get that on Amazon.com. Remember, you can also Google uh, Indiana University Books and Beyond. It's a wonderful organization by Michael's wife, Nancy. And also, you can check out more about Michael if you're still craving more knowledge about him on theuslincompany.com. So thank you for joining me today. Thanks,